Get ready for Christmas. Celebrate the presents. Get ready for Christmas. Celebrate the presents. Luke 1, chapter 1, verse 5 to 17. Now, you know, 27% of the Bible is poetry. When prophets had a word from God, they often spoke poetically. Like fire shut up in the bones, they couldn't sit and let it be. I pray before my words that the Spirit goes ahead of me, that I may glorify the one who died for sin instead of me. Christmas ain't all about the presence and decor. Christmas is all about the presence of the Lord. Jesus is king. He came to take his crown. I'm not trying to make this up. I'm trying to break this down. Christmas is coming up. It must be wrapping season. But what does it mean to get ready for Christmas? Sales and stockings, music and mistletoe. We may have prepared our homes for company, but have we prepared our hearts for Christ? When I was growing up, I used to love having company over the house. But there was always something we had to do before company came. Something I hated doing. We had to clean up. I'd be like, Mom, why I got to clean my room? Nobody's going to be in my room. Next thing I know, my room turns into the room for the coats. I'd be like, how's she going to tell me what should be done in my room? My mom be like, your room? What you mean your room? You lucky I let you live here. I had to clean up my room and allow it to be used as my mother saw fit. About 2,000 years ago, John the Baptist came on the scene to tell people that special company was coming. And they had to get ready. Their lives had to be cleaned up. And we can strive to be cleaned up as well. And if I ever ask how someone can tell me what should be done in my life, I can imagine God saying, what you mean your life? You're lucky I let you live here. We have to clean up our lives and allow them to be used as the Father sees fit. Ever hear a song or a phrase that takes you back, that reminds you of something? If I said, I've got sunshine on a cloudy day, many people would recognize the song I'm alluding to. And as we've said before, songs can take us back. They can remind us of the olden days. In any case, this text is dripping with Old Testament allusions. So many things take us back to the Old Testament. Because you see, John the Baptist serves as a transitional bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. His purpose is to prepare the way for the Lord. To prepare God's people for God's presence. Luke 1, verse 5, our passage begins. It says, It came to pass in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah from the priestly division of Abijah. And with him was his wife from the female descendants, literally it says daughters, of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Now King Herod, a.k.a. Herod the Great, he ruled as king over Palestine from 37 B.C. to 4 B.C. He was appointed king by Mark Antony in the Roman Senate. John the Baptist and Jesus were born right before he died. Now, this dude was crazy. We'll talk about him later. Maybe not this study, but Herod was a paranoid king. He killed many people to reign as long as possible. But he couldn't kill the king who would reign forever and ever. And as we'll see, biblical names are important. Zechariah means the Lord has remembered. As we find in 1 Chronicles 24, during the reigns of kings David and Solomon, we'll see that priests were divided into 24 divisions or orders. And 1 Chronicles 24.10 tells us that Abijah was the 8th division. And it's interesting that the ninth division is that of Yeshua, the Hebrew form of the name Jesus. That's 1 Chronicles 24, 10 and 11. The seventh to Hakos, the eighth to Abijah, the ninth to Yeshua, the tenth to Shechaniah. These are the priestly divisions. And the eighth was Abijah, and the ninth, right after, is Yeshua, which is the Hebrew form of the name Jesus. Interesting parallels here. Now, priests, they could marry any godly Israelite woman who was a virgin. However, daughters of priests, especially those in Aaron's family tree, Aaron was the brother of Moses, especially those in Aaron's family tree, they were preferred. So I say all that to say that 
Since Zechariah and Elizabeth both came from a priestly pedigree, this would enhance the status of any children they had. So basically, John the Baptist has the best spiritual ancestry. As the saying goes, John the Baptist comes from good stock. And it's interesting, in Exodus 6, we actually find that Moses' brother Aaron was also married to a woman named Elizabeth. In Exodus 6.23, Exodus 6.23, Aaron married Elisheva, daughter of Aminadab, and sister of Nashon. And she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. So Elisheva is the Hebrew equivalent of Elizabeth. So Aaron was married to a woman named Elizabeth. And Aaron's sister's name was Miriam. We see this in Exodus 15.20. Aaron's sister's name was Miriam. Then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. Aaron, the brother of Moses, has a sister named Miriam, which is the Hebrew form of the name Mary. So lots of parallels here with Aaron, and Elizabeth, and Mary. As you said, this passage has so many allusions that take us back to the Old Testament. We'll see more and more of that as the study progresses. All right, so continuing in Luke 1, 6, it says, Now they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking in all the commands and requirements of the Lord blamelessly. Luke 1, 6. So they not only had good heritage, they also had godly habits. Now, as you may recall, walking is a metaphor for how one behaves, how one lives. And Zechariah and Elizabeth both lived lives that were wholly devoted to the Lord. They were righteous in God's sight, in God's opinion. You know, there's a lot of people out there with opinions about how we should conduct ourselves. But there's really only one opinion that matters when it comes to how we live our life. That of the one who gave us life. And we have to keep this in mind. For we live in a world where what is wrong in the sight of the Creator, is considered right in the sight of the creatures. Isaiah 5, verse 20 and 21 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Isaiah 5, 20 to 21. There's a lot of things in America that people think are good, but are actually evil. And the funny thing is that this country is so backwards that people will call you evil for calling evil what it is. We say something is bad and we get called bigots. But if something is bad in God's sight, it doesn't change with the shifting sands of public opinion. Sometimes we get things twisted as if morality is determined by democracy. Could you imagine talking to God like, hey, God, we took a vote. And uh, we decided that this is okay. It's okay to do these things now. As if we made the rules. I can imagine trying that when I was a kid. Yeah, Dad, uh, Terrence and I, we, we took a vote. And uh, we decided that it's okay for us to stay up all night and watch cartoons. That wouldn't go over well. How can the kids talk back to the father? How can the clay talk back to the potter? In any case, Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous and blameless in God's sight. Now, the words righteous and blameless often occur together when describing some very important Old Testament figures. We'll see this with Noah. We'll see this with Job. Also, Abraham. They were all described as righteous and blameless. Genesis 6, 9, Job 1, 1, Job 1, 8. We'll skip that for the, the sake of time. But this is familiar biblical language. That being said, these people were not morally perfect nor sinless, yet they did follow God's commands faithfully. Here, righteous refers to someone who lives according to the will of God. This does not refer to being made righteous in God's sight through the blood of Christ. It means being morally upright. They walked uprightly and obediently in the sight of the Lord. As we said, in life we can walk God's way or we can try to walk our own way. But of course, God's way is the right way, the righteous way. Continuing in Luke 1, 7, 
and they had no child because Elizabeth was unable to have children, and they were both advanced in age. Libby says they were advanced in their days. So Zechariah and Elizabeth were good people who came from good families. They seem like the ideal couple, yet they had no children. As Elizabeth confesses in verse 25, in their culture to be childless was a great misfortune and disgrace. Having children was seen as a divine blessing for faithfulness. Not having children was often seen as a divine punishment for sin. So this means many people would assume that they had done something wrong. Even today, many people believe that if something bad happens to someone, they must have done something wrong. But as scripture tells us, it's not always that simple. Sometimes, at least in the short term, the wicked do prosper and the righteous do suffer. In any case, children were expected to take care of their parents as they grew older. They were to honor their father and mother. This is likely the meaning of that commandment. Back then, if one had no children, one had no social security. So this was a tough situation both socially and economically. Nonetheless, we're, we've all been told that this situation is not due to their sin, for they were morally upright in God's sight, as we've just seen in the previous verse. Zechariah and Elizabeth are not childless because of sin, but so that the works of God might be revealed in them. And Jewish readers would pick up on the parallels with the Old Testament matriarchs, who were also not able to have children at first. As you may recall, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, Jacob's wife, Rachel, Samuel's mother, Hannah, and the mother of Samson, they were all unable to conceive at first. I'll just leave these on the PowerPoints. If you want to check out these scriptures, you can see Genesis 25, 21, Isaac Pray to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebecca became pregnant. Rachel remained childless for a while, Genesis 29, 31, also Genesis 31. And Hannah, she prayed to the Lord weeping bitterly, asking for a son, said that he would never have his hair cut. You see that in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 10 to 11. But for the sake of time, we'll just keep it moving. Also see Judges 13, 2-5 for Samson's mother. However, the situation is most similar to that of Abraham and Sarah. For Sarah and Elizabeth were both too old to have children. As we see in Genesis 11 and 30 and Genesis 18 11, they were both too old to have children. But like the others who were miraculously born to women unable to conceive, John the Baptist will become a major player in God's game plan. And as we see, the Lord can bring about salvation in spite of human limitations. So no matter what you think your limitations are that are holding you back physically, mentally, spiritually, God can still use you for greatness. All right, Luke 1, 8. And it came to pass while he was serving as a priest in the presence of God, when it was the turn of his division. All right, so priests, they served in a temple where the special presence of the Lord dwelled. In the most holy place, also called the Holy of Holies. Now, of course, God is omnipresent, but his special presence dwelled in the temple. If God's presence was like a cellular signal, the temple was the world's holiest hotspot. And the closer one got to the temple sanctuary and to the Holy of Holies, the more holy and ceremonially clean one had to be. Continuing in, in verse 9. According to the custom of the priesthood, and he was chosen by lot to enter into the sanctuary of the Lord to burn an incense offering. So now at this time, there were perhaps as many as 18,000 priests and Levites, so that they had more than enough help to run the temple. All divisions served during the time of the major Jewish festivals and holy days, that is the Passover, Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Day of Atonement. Now during the other times... Each of the 24 divisions served in two non-consecutive weeks per year on a rotating schedule. When the appointed time for a division came, the priests would cast lots to decide who would do what. You ever draw straws or pull names out of a hat? Casting lots was similar to that. It was like throwing dice to discern God's will. And casting lots, which had certain rules and regulations, was used to decide 
many things in scripture. We don't know what the exact process of casting lots was, but it may have involved marking stones that corresponded with certain individuals, putting those marked stones in a container, and then casting one of the marked stones out. Whoever stone came out of the container will be the one who was chosen. So it might have been something like drawing straws or pulling names out of a hat. So we don't know exactly what it was like, but casting lots was used a lot in scripture. So for example, on the Day of Atonement, we'll see in Leviticus 16, 8 to 10, he is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as a scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. So one goat will be killed and sacrificed. The other goat will be driven out into the wilderness. That was the scapegoat. So they would have to cast lots to see which goat would be the one to be killed. Also, the disciples, they replaced Judas by casting lots. You'll see that. In Acts 1, 23 to 26, they cast lots. We'll see in verse 26, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. Also, Proverbs 16, 33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Its every decision is from the Lord. So it might seem random, but Scripture affirms that you know God is in control. That being said, I doubt we need to resort to such methods today. I don't want anyone thinking that I said it's okay to get like a magic eight ball you know, since the, the Holy Spirit has come, we can rely on him for guidance. Romans 8 tells us that we who are the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. Not to mention the Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures. And the scriptures guide us as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Sometimes we yearn to hear a word from the Lord, like an audible word. We look for voicemail without checking his text messages. In life, we ask God for direction, but do we actually read God's directions? We have to read his instructions for guidance. In any case, because of the large number of priests, to burn an incense offering was essentially a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Some priests never got the chance. But we can see how God orchestrated this entire encounter. This is Zechariah's big day, the biggest moment of his life. Now, incense offerings were burned daily before the morning sacrifice and after the evening sacrifice at sunrise and dusk. We'll see this in Exodus 30, verses 7 to 8. This is where this command was first given. Now, Luke doesn't specify, but it's likely the evening offering where Zechariah's offering, incense offering. And this may have been done to quench the stench of the dead animals that had previously been sacrificed. You know, at certain times when we do certain things, there's a certain odor. So people light a match to get rid of the smell. Could have been something like that. But in any case, the priest whose lot was chosen would typically clean the altar, burn fresh incense, and prostrate himself in prayer. Now, the, the temple complex had several courts and chambers. The central building of the complex was the sanctuary. This is where the sacrifices were offered. And here Luke is referring to the sanctuary, which was also called the holy place. Get a zoomed in view. Now only priests could enter the sanctuary and only the high priest could enter the most holy place once a year on the Day of Atonement. That is Yom Kippur. On the Day of Atonement, sacrifices were made to atone for the sins of the entire nation of Israel. Now on Good Friday, when Jesus made the atoning sacrifice, the veil or the curtain that blocked off the Holy of Holies was torn in two. So as we see in Luke 23, 44 to 46, it was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed, his last. So the veil that blocked off the most holy place, you see the veil here, it blocks off the Holy of Holies. That veil was torn in two when Jesus, our atoning sacrifice, 
died on the cross. Now the tearing of the temple curtain could symbolize God's presence leaving the temple as we see in Ezekiel 10 and 11, or it could indicate that as a result of Christ's atoning sacrifice, there is now a new access to the presence of the Lord. Before only certain people could approach the Lord's presence on certain days after doing certain rituals. But thanks to the presence of the Lord Jesus on earth, the Lamb of God who sacrificed himself for our sins, we can all be in the presence of God. And that's the best of all Christmas presents. Continuing in Luke 1.10. And the whole assembly of the people was praying outside at the time of the incense offering. Now the times of the morning and evening sacrifices were also the main times for public prayer. The people were outside of the sanctuary but still inside of the temple complex. The temple complex was huge. The temple complex was much larger than several American football fields. So the people would be in another place, not in the sanctuary. Only priests could go there. They would be outside. Jewish men would be in the court of Israel. Jewish women would be in the court of women. And the rising smoke from the incense symbolized the people's prayers rising to God. According to a later tradition, the people would pray, May the merciful God enter the holy place and accept with favor the offering of his people. May the merciful God enter the holy place. They prayed for the Lord's presence the Lord's presence. Continuing in Luke Luke 1 11. Continuing in Luke 1 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right of the altar of the incense offering. Luke 1 11. Now the altar was in the center of the sanctuary outside the most holy place and in their culture the right side was the place of honor and power and favor. As you may recall, Jesus is portrayed as sitting at the right hand of God. For example, later in Luke Acts, Luke and Acts are actually a two-volume set written by Luke. Later in Acts 7, 55-56, before the deacon Stephen was stoned, it says in Acts 7, 55-56, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Of God. Acts 7 55 to 56. In any case, Zechariah is a holy priest in a holy place performing a holy sacrifice. And then he sees a holy creature. As you may recall, an angel also appeared to the mother of Samson and to Hagar, the mother of Ishmael. And of course, Abraham and Sarah also had some angelic visitation. Now, later in verse 19, the angel identifies himself as Gabriel, which means man of God. Luke 1.19 says, The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Luke 1.19. And it's interesting that Gabriel also appears in a similar scene in Daniel 9.20-21, which says, While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and making my request to the Lord, my God, for his holy hill. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in a swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. So all these Old Testament allusions. Recall that Zechariah is likely burning incense around the time of the evening sacrifice. Again, there's many allusions that take us back to the Old Testament. Now, as has been said, the word translated appear describes an objective appearance, not a subjective vision. This is actually the same word used to describe the physical appearance of the resurrected Lord to his disciples. So this is very real. Zechariah is not imagining this. This is very real, and Zechariah is real scared. But let's keep it real. How would you react if you were praying and an angel appeared right next to you? Sometimes I get scared when I see my own shadow, let alone a divine being. Luke 1, 12. And when Zechariah saw the angel, he was shaken, and fear fell upon him. Zechariah was all shook up. I'd be shook too. You ever see something that shook you up? The word here literally means to shake together. 
Zechariah was in great emotional distress. He was shook. And fear is a typical reaction for someone in Scripture who encounters an angel. In Scripture, Gideon, Daniel, Isaiah, and many more become fearful when they see an angel. They didn't think they could see the divine and not die. Imagine if an angel from heaven popped up next to you right now. You might be thinking, it might be my time to go to heaven. Maybe the angels come to, you know, take me home. But nonetheless, as a result of people's fear, angels often tell people not to be afraid. Fear not. As we see in Luke 1.13, our next verse. But the angel said to him, Do not fear, Zechariah, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call him the name John. Luke 1, 13. But what was Zechariah's petition? What was his prayer? Some believe he prayed for the redemption of Israel and the coming of the long-awaited Messiah. Priests typically would pray for Israel's deliverance. and This was the main point of the evening prayer and sacrifice. Yet others say he was praying for a son. But it really wouldn't be appropriate to pray for private wishes during his priestly service. And by that time, he may have thought that ship had long sailed. However, it could be both. He may have prayed for a son privately in the past and now offered a priestly petition for the salvation of Israel. In any case, God answers both prayers at the same time, meeting both personal and corporate needs. Don't you know that God can answer prayer in ways we've never dreamed of? Don't you know that he is able to do more than all we can ask or imagine? But what's on our Christmas wish list? Are we praying for what's best for us or for what's best for God's people? Do we want God to give us more gifts or do we want God to give us more of God, more of himself? Do you want more things or do we want that one thing? The one thing that Psalmist talks about in Psalm 27:4. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. That one thing, the presence of the Lord. The psalmist is asking to be in the presence of the Lord. You know, we have a phrase for people who get into relationships because of what the other person can give them materially. They may not really love that person at all, but they like the presence they give. In our relationship with God, are we gold diggers? Do you know someone who always has their hand out? Every time they see you, they ask you for a favor. Seems like they always want something, right? They likely don't want to talk to you more or get to know you better. Only time they want to talk is when they need a couple dollars. They just want what you can give them. They're more concerned with what you can present them with than you being present with them. Let's not be like that with God. Let's not let the only time we talk to God be when we're asking for something. Let's not let the only time we come to God be when we have our hands out. We should seek to spend more time with the Lord and his word, to talk to him more, to get to know him better, to have a better relationship. As has been said, we ought to seek God's face, not his hand. That is, we should focus more on our personal relationship with God than the blessings his hand provides. Seek God's face, not his hand. We don't want to be like this all the time with God. We want to seek God's face and not his hand. In any case, John comes from the Hebrew name Yohanan, which means Yahweh, the Lord, is gracious, or the Lord has shown favor. A quick note, many people do say Jehovah, and there's a long history behind that rendering, but the personal name of the Lord that he revealed to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3, 13 to 15, is likely pronounced Yahweh. Whenever you see the Lord in small caps in the Bible, that is the personal name of the Lord likely pronounced Yahweh. Now for centuries, instead of saying his name, people have said the Lord, 
out of respect. Jews did not want to take the Lord's name in vain, so they would avoid saying it altogether. Now, Yah is an abbreviation of Yahweh that is found in many names. For example, Isaiah means salvation of Yah. Jeremiah means whom Yahweh has appointed. Micah means who is like unto Yahweh, who is like the Lord. We sing that song, who is like the Lord. And of course, hallelujah means praise the Lord, praise Yah. And as we said, Zechariah means the Lord, Yahweh, has remembered. Here, God remembers Zechariah by graciously giving them a child who will bring about change. John the Baptist's name speaks of God's grace, God's unmerited favor. You know, sometimes we get things twisted and think that God owes us something. As we've said, Romans 11.35 reminds us, Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? Everything we have flows from God's grace, His unmerited favor. God doesn't owe us nothing, but we owe Him everything. In the Old Testament, angels also announce the names of Ishmael and Isaac. In fact, the language is almost identical to the angel's word about Isaac. So we see in Genesis 16:11, the angel says, You shall name him Ishmael. And in Genesis 17, 19, then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. Very similar language. And then the great prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. So lots of times where people have been named, have been named divinely in the Old Testament. So again, this is taking us back to some Old Testament passages. You see, in Scripture, when God names someone, it often relates to their destiny or how they will be used for God's plan. Jacob to Israel, Abram to Abraham. We can see this a lot in Scripture. Later, an angel will tell Mary to name her child Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1.21 says, She will give birth to a son. This is the angel speaking. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Now, Jesus, or Jesus, is the equivalent to the Hebrew name Yeshua, or Joshua, which means Yah, Yahweh saves, the Lord saves. Jesus' name means the Lord saves. And he came to save his people from their sins. There's a lot of meaning in the names. Do you know the meaning of your name? If so, please type it in the comments. I want to see what your names mean and see if you know what your name means. Now, when God names someone in Scripture, it is of great importance. When we give names, it is important to a degree, but it doesn't necessarily affect someone's destiny. If it did, I would change my name to Rich Tall. Rich Tall. Tall. Oh. All right. Okay. <laughs> One fourteen. There will be joy and exultation for you, and many on account of his birth will be overjoyed. Overjoyed. Now, it's no surprise that having a child would cause rejoicing for John's parents, but the angel suggests that his birth would cause rejoicing for John's people. As we'll see, John the Baptist told people to repent, and repentance is almost a dirty word in our culture. But though it might sound like a negative message, John will bring about joy. People would rejoice because he's instrumental in ushering in the messianic age, preparing the way for the Lord. Salvation had finally come near. That's good news. That's great news. And as you read in Luke 1, 15, For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He may never drink any wine or alcoholic beverage. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. In Luke 7, 28, Jesus says, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Luke 7, 28. John will be great in the sight of the Lord because he will be used in the service of the Lord. 
the Savior has a different standard of greatness than society. John the Baptist was great, and we can be even greater as members in Christ's kingdom, about which John prophesied. Speaking of greatness, who was the greatest basketball player? Who was the greatest singer of all time? Who was the, the greatest rapper of all time? People can argue about this for hours. I've seen it happen. You know why? Part of the reason is that there is no objective criteria for basketball players, singers, or rappers. Everyone has their own subjective standard. Do you judge based on stats or rings, who they played against, who they played with? Is it based on vocal range and skill, record sales, awards? There's no agreed upon criteria. However, as we said, when it comes to living life, the only criteria that matters is from the one who is giving life. Being great in the eyes of God means giving our lives to God. Are we trying to be great? By whose standard? It's not about human standards, it's about holy standards. Let's not chase greatness in the eyes of men, but chase greatness in the eyes of our Maker. Now the word translated alcoholic beverage refers to fermented drinks made from grain and not from grapes. So some translated strong drink, they didn't really have strong drinks back then. They'd really have distilled beverages like whiskey or gin or vodka at that time. Although the term can refer to any fermented drink in general, it likely refers to beverages like beer. So basically John the Baptist was to abstain from any alcohol his whole life due to his special consecration for service to the Lord. Now, you know anyone who drinks a little something and starts thinking that they're Superman? Some people get real bold after a little bit of liquor. They get liquid courage. In ancient times, some actually thought that one could get divine powers by drinking alcohol. In contrast, as we've said, John the Baptist will be empowered by the divine spirit, not the wine spirits. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit, not the Spirits. Be filled with the Spirit, not the Spirits. So watch what you put in your eggnog this year. <laughs> now, in the Old Testament, Nazarites were people who made a special vow to God, dedicating themselves for service. Part of the Nazarite vow was to abstain from alcohol. See that in Numbers 6, 1 to 4. They also could not cut their hair or come near dead bodies. And I'll leave these on the on the, the slideshow. Check out number six, one to eight, especially for the Nazarite vow. And then we also see in Judges thirteen seven, because these vows were usually temporary. But Samson's mother was told that her child was to be a Nazarite from birth. This is why Samson could not cut his hair because he was a Nazarite. He will be a Nazareth of God from the womb until the day of his death. We see that in Judges 13, 7. And of course, Samuel, his mother said that no razor would ever be used on his head. So perhaps John is being portrayed as sort of a Nazarite prophet. However, if you see Leviticus 10, 9, Leviticus tells the priests that they could not drink wine or beer during their service as well. So all things considered, John has elements of both priest and prophet priest and prophet and being filled with the Holy Spirit is what enables John the Baptist to prophesy and he'll be filled with the Spirit while still in his mother's womb in the Old Testament the Spirit would come upon certain people for certain tasks temporarily but John will be filled with the Holy Spirit permanently as Christians are today now John is the only person said to be filled with the Spirit even in the womb this may not ever happen again, but children in the womb who are created in God's image can certainly still be used by God. Therefore, children should be protected even while they're in the mother's womb. Speaking of children, Luke 1.16 says, And he will turn many of the descendants, literally sons, of Israel back to the Lord their God. Luke 1.16 now, the word translated turn refers to a changed course of conduct and can refer to a religious or a moral conversion and repentance. John would bring back God's covenant people 
back to their Lord. Marcus Garvey wanted his people to go back to the motherland. John the Baptist wants his people to go back to the father's hand. John has priestly blood from both sides of his family, and he will serve like a priest. He will be an intermediary between God and God's people Israel. Many, but not all, will respond. Also, as we said on Sunday, echoing the Lord's words to the Israelites at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, 5 through 6, 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests, and we need to act as priestly intermediaries between people and God. Like John, we should be pleading with people to repent and turn back to the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. As we've said, we should be ambassadors for Christ, imploring people to be reconciled to God, as we see in 2 Corinthians 5.20. Do you have a relative who has wandered from the way? Do you have a loved one who doesn't love Jesus? Do you have a friend who was estranged from the Father? We all need to intercede for folks. We need to be on our knees in prayer, not just praying for those who are sick physically, but for those who are sick spiritually. And we need to open our mouths. We can't be ashamed of the gospel. We can't be ashamed of the word of the one who gave us life. If we are ashamed of him, he says, he'll be ashamed of us. As we see in Mark 8.38, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. We need to be ambassadors for Christ who are not afraid and not ashamed of the gospel. So let's not be bashful for the Lord. Let's be bold for the Lord. As we've said, someone else might harvest the crop later, but we can plant the seed today. Instead of talking about so much bad news at the dinner table, let's talk about the good news at the dinner table. What better subject could there be for Christmas dinner than Christ? This is the perfect time to talk about the reason for the season. This Christmas, let's prepare to proclaim Christ, just like John the Baptist, as you read in Luke 117, our final verse of the night. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous, to prepare for the Lord, a people made ready. Luke 1, 17. Luke 1, 17. So go before him refers to John being the forerunner of the Lord, the forerunner of the Lord. Jews knew that Elijah was to come before the day of the Lord, the great and terrible day of the Lord, which meant both salvation for the faithful and judgment for the faithless. Gabriel's words echo Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, which says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. He's alluding to this prophecy from Malachi 4. Now, there's much debate about the meaning of turning hearts of the parents to their children. This could refer to the fathers, the older generation who have fallen away from the Lord, and they turn to the sons, the younger generation, who do follow the Lord. It could also mean that the fathers of the Jewish faith, that is the patriarchs, would view their descendants favorably after they repented. It could also mean something like the fathers would fulfill their fatherly duties of discipline once again. It's a lot of different suggestions, but it seems likely that it means that generations of families will be reconciled. As we've said, the people are on one accord with their vertical relationship with God. It should lead to a harmonious, horizontal relationship with other people of God. As you may recall, the first and greatest commandment concerns the vertical relationship. The second commandment concerns the horizontal relationship. As we see in Luke 10, 27, He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The two greatest commandments. Jesus says in, later in Luke 10, 27. 
Now the spirit of Elijah, the spirit of Elijah does not refer to Elijah's human spirit, but the divine spirit. The Holy Spirit which also possessed Elijah. As you may recall in, in 2 Kings 2, Elisha asked Elijah for a double portion of his spirit, and Elisha goes on to perform twice as many miracles as Elijah. However, John the Baptist did not perform any miracles. We see that in John 10, 41. After Jesus was accused of blasphemy for claiming to be God earlier in John 10, in John 10, 40, 42, it says, Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, Though John never performed a sign, that is a miracle, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Now, most of us will likely never perform a miracle either. But like John, we can tell people the truth about Jesus. And hopefully they will also believe in Jesus. That being said, the power of Elijah does not refer to Elijah's prophetic miracles, but Elijah's prophetic authority. Like Elijah, John proclaims a powerful message calling for repentance. And in Luke and Acts, the Spirit often empowers people to proclaim the word of God boldly. We too need to pray for boldness to proclaim the word of God. Because it's easy to do what everyone else is doing and say what everyone else is saying and think like everyone else is thinking. It's easy to go with the flow. But as has been said, only dead fish swim with the stream. Since we've been made alive in Jesus, we can't just fit in with the culture. We have to stand out for the Christ. Now the word translated understanding refers to a way of thinking, a frame of mind, a mindset. John would change the mindset of the rebellious to the mindset of the wise, those who are wise with godly wisdom. Do you know anyone who has book smarts but no common sense? A good GPA can lead to a good college and a good job, but godly wisdom can lead to good judgment and a good life, a life pleasing to the Lord. By changing people's mindset to that of godly wisdom, people would be prepared for the Lord. A people prepared alludes to Isaiah 40, verse 3, which Luke quotes in Luke 3, 4. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. This also recalls Malachi 3, 1, where the Lord says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, will come, says the Lord Almighty. The Lord you are seeking will come to the temple, the presence of the Lord. In Luke 7.27, Jesus quotes this very passage when referring to John the Baptist. This is the one about whom it is written, it says, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Luke 7.27 so Malachi's prophecy said that Elijah was to come before the coming of the Lord himself. As Jesus indicates, John the Baptist fulfills this prophecy. We see this in Matthew 11, verses 13 and 14. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Later in Matthew 17, 10 to 13, the disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. He is the Elijah who was to come. So John the Baptist was the prophesied Elijah-like prophet, and his role was to prepare his people to follow the Lord. God wants to lead his people out of darkness, but they have to be ready to follow. Can you lead someone who insists on walking their own way? Imagine being in a group of people who are lost in a forest. The sun goes down and it's pitch black. Some say we should go this way, others say we should go that way, then everyone starts going their own way. But then someone comes from afar and says, hey, come back, turn around. Someone's coming to save us. If people don't turn around, 
how can they be saved? John the Baptist will essentially say, someone's on the way. And in fact, that someone is the way. He is the way maker, the light in the darkness. But people can't follow the one who is the way out of darkness unless they turn around, unless they come back, unless they repent. Repentance is a prerequisite for following Jesus. For we can't follow Jesus if we're still going our own way. As you see in Luke 3, John the Baptist called the people of Israel to confess their sins, repent from ungodliness, and turn back to God. Repentance is like a U-turn, turning from our old way of life to the new way of the Lord. Now, sometimes we struggle and it's more like a K-turn, but there still should be a change of direction. Back then, people would indicate their repentance by being baptized by John. Now, preaching repentance sounds so negative, but the fact that God gives people a chance to repent is good news. In Luke 3, 8, and 9, John the Baptist tells the crowds, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Then when people were wondering if John the Baptist was the Messiah, that is the Christ, he responded in Luke 3, 16-18, which says, John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. So we see the same contrast between fruitful trees and chaff that we saw last week in Psalm 1. And we talked about how in Scripture, separating the wheat from the chaff is often a metaphor for divine judgment. So ironically, here John is talking about repentance, divine judgment, and good news. He's proclaiming good news. Because the fact that creatures can turn back to their creator is good news. And this is the good news we must preach. In fact, in Luke's version of the Great Commission, in Luke 24, 46-47, it says, He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. And this is what we have to preach. But like with John, not all will respond to such preaching. In fact, people will likely get angry with us. John the Baptist is eventually beheaded for calling out the king for his unlawful affair with his brother's wife. People love it when we talk about the blessings of the next life. People hate it when we talk and start to messing with their sex life. According to scripture, sex ought to be between a husband and a wife. Now this is an extremely politically incorrect statement, but it is biblically correct. People call you old fashioned and a bigot in a second, but I am not ashamed of God's word and I don't answer to them. I answer to someone with just a little more authority than them. In any case, regardless of what we've done in the past, we thank God for the opportunity to clean up in the present. Moreover, telling people to turn back to God is loving. You ever go out and about talking to people and having a good time, then you get home and you got a bug in your nose? I get mad at people like, why didn't anybody tell me? No one told me I had a bug in my nose. I've been talking to people all day. Anyway, boogies are no big deal. They have no lasting consequences. Yet if we truly care about people, we should tell them about the truth of Christ, which has eternal consequences. Like Elijah, John the Baptist challenged people to make a commitment, to make a decision. As we see in our last scripture of the night, 1 Kings 18.21, Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Of course, God won that contest between the prophets of Baal 
and Elijah. It was, he was on fire that day. But anyway, John the Baptist is like Elijah. And Elijah told the people to get off the fence. We can't have one foot in the word and one foot in the world. As has been said, ain't no such thing as halfway crooks. You can't be a partial crook. You either steal or you don't. In the same way, there ain't no such thing as halfway Christians. You can't be a partial follower. You either follow or you don't. In conclusion, my brothers and sisters, are we ready for Christmas? Are we prepared for the Lord? Are we ready to follow the way or are we still going our own way? We may have prepared our homes for company, but have we prepared our hearts for Christ? Let's not merely celebrate the presence under the tree, but the presence of the Lord, who came and dwelled among us. It's not about the presence or crying for Santa. It's about the Lord's presence and crying Hosanna. Christ came in the flesh. You know the grace that it took? Let's get off social media and put our face in the book. Let's preach the gospel until we have no more breath, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Always keep a godly wish list in view and tell God, all I want for Christmas is you.